Welcome to the Lord's house, everyone. As we begin today, we're going to begin just a little bit different. Matt, we're just there. Matt, tell us what we're going to be praying about. <laughs> So that's how we're going to open church today is let's bow in prayer and ask the Lord's presence to heal. Father of heaven, I thank you that you are always present and that you are there in the emergency room at this time. Your grace is full and free and we ask for you to bring it upon him in a healing way. We ask for the family that you would be a comfort to them, standing with them as the questions are being answered through doctors. Lord, will you be their strength through your spirit? Thank you, God, that you have given us a part in your work there in the emergency room through our prayers. Amen. And so this takes on a little special different meaning when I say this today, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Because we're also believing the Lord is there too. As we're doing some announcements, I know that we have, there you are, <laughs> got to keep looking for where people are sitting. Come on up. It's the time of year to hear about how the church functions. <laughs>
I invite you to our call to worship from Psalm 80. I've taken refuge in you, Lord. Don't let me ever be put to shame. Bend your ear toward me and save me. Be my rock of refuge where I can always escape. I imagine you can think of more than a thousand ways that God has been your refuge. He's been your rescue. Number 57, it just puts it a ballpark a thousand. Stand and let's praise the Lord for what he's done for us. Number 57. You may be seated. We have a treat today because Summer Sunday School is going to present some of what they have been learning over this time. So Pat, again, I'm looking around at where you are. There she is. (laughs) Come on up and have the kids do what you've prepared them to do. Tell me what. 
what we learn from that parable. Now, guys, we just discussed, we don't want them to think that girls are always the smartest. Okay, who can tell me about the Good Samaritan? Pierce, I know you can. Jesus was asked, how do I get to heaven? What did they say? What did he say? Really now? Again. Love your neighbor as yourself. And who is our neighbor? Everyone. And we also discussed how sometimes in school, especially when we're little, sometimes it's really hard because kids aren't always nice. Grown-ups aren't always nice. But, and so sometimes we discussed how we just need to do our best and to try and help that person because we don't always know what that person is going through. Okay, what about the lost sheep? And this one, I actually brought mustard seeds, let them see them, and taste them. And some of them wanted to pull. <laughs> okay, who can tell me about the mustard seed? always what? Be faithful and ready for what? The second coming of Jesus. So, like you said, the picture had two people and it didn't matter which one was which. We must always all be ready. Okay, what about the parable of the friend in the night?
Uh, kids head to Sunday school, feel free to greet each other. Our Old Testament reading today comes from Jeremiah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Don't say I'm only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And one of the things that God has called all of us to is that building and planning process through our tithes and offerings. So ushers, if you would give us the opportunity to build the kingdom of God here in St. Francis and beyond through our gifts. Let's join in prayer. 
Lord of heaven, you have blessed us. You have given to us. And now we return these gifts to you. Honor them, I pray, for the work of your goodness and kingdom. Amen. If you grab the hymnal with me, 369, Blessed Assurance. You may be seated as we come to our gospel reading today. We're at the Luke Gospel, chapter 13. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days when work is done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan is bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. One of the great things we get to do in prayer is glorify God, just like the people did as they saw things action. So in a moment, give you a chance to glorify God. And before we do that, I want to make sure, Matt, I know there was somebody else that you wanted us to be remembering in prayer. Help us remember. All right, so one of those glory things, Dan Stang doing better, may get to come home tomorrow. 
And you shared with me of something else we can glory to the Lord in. So Neva thanks everybody for the letter that she received. Keep her in prayer. There's still more of the healing journey ahead. How else can we support each other in prayer? Either glorying in what the Lord has done or praying to see what he's going to do in situations. for Russell and Claudia and their loss. Now, being that Joanna's in the hospital, <laughs> she's up at the nursing home right now, and uh, she still got a way to go before she can get to the doctor's appointment. So we appreciate the prayers. So. Yeah. She's doing better, but she's got to improve a little bit more. Yeah, praise the Lord for Val Jean's journey to this point, and now over at the nursing home for a little more healing to happen. It's going to be having surgery Tuesday. Let's join together in prayer. Father of heaven, thank you for hearing our hearts. You are constantly listening to us and you are always our refuge and our strength. We trust you in the circumstances that we have mentioned many on the health side of things that are, are needing your presence there, needing your healing graces. We thank you for what we've seen of your action in different people making it to this point in their healing journey. We're trusting you to complete the journeys. And Lord, we ask for comfort in the family with the loss. We ask that you will be a present comfort. For you said you are the God of all comfort. And we're simply asking you to be present as who you are. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today in Ephesians, we're at chapter 3, and we're going to kind of browse through the whole chapter today, because it all has to do with a prayer that Paul is giving for the church there, even though he kind of interrupts himself in the middle of it, want to keep the beginning and the end together. So chapter 3 of Ephesians, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, 
assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which is not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Would you bow with me? Holy Spirit, open our hearts that we can be present in the words today, that we can hear how you are speaking to us so that we can act how you are calling us to act. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. In chapter 3, Paul starts out saying, for this reason I'm going to pray, and then he kind of stops to think about everything God has done for the Ephesians before he comes back around and says, for this reason I bow my knees. And one of the words that you see happened as Paul especially makes that little insert in the middle of his prayer, one of the words that you see over and over again is about power. Very big word in Ephesus because Ephesus was a center of the occult. And you may remember back a couple weeks ago when we were reading from Acts that as the gospel began to reach into the community and they began to see the power that was in Jesus' name, some of the people started saying, well, if that's where power is, I'm just going to run out and I'm going to do this. In the name of Jesus, demons be gone. And it didn't work out very well because they didn't know Jesus. They only knew magic, if you're a fill-in-the-blank person. Mystery, not magic, is what Paul brought to them, but magic was what they were used to using. They were used to doing spells and incantations, trying to control life, control circumstances. Anybody remember the song, Love Potion Number 9? All right, there was a potion for everything. There was a spell for everything. And this was kind of how Ephesians addressed life, trying to bring it under their control. They wanted the power to keep it within their hands. And Paul comes and shows that Jesus is more powerful than all the magic, and the people, as they begin to realize the mystery of faith in Christ, begin to take their magic books, throw them in the street, and burn them. Thousands of dollars worth of books that they burned to renounce magic and live in the mystery that Jesus Christ, God himself, had come to them in power to make them children of God. And so several times, three that I remember right off the reading here, Paul brings out that God is powerful in their midst because this was kind of the language, what they were looking for. They wanted to have life in their own hands. And you may be sitting there thinking, oh, I'd never delve into magic. I'd never pull out spells and go, well, you know, I just went to Dollar General and you can buy a book of Harry Potter spells that the author, she said she took them from a real magic book. And you can pull it out and you can say, this is how I'm going to try and control my life. 
But I'm guessing you're probably not going to do that. However, have you been pulling out your checkbook and trying to control life? And you're only really thinking life is in control when you've got a certain balance in the bank. Or have you been pulling out your calendar, trying to control your circumstances, and saying, if I can just make it to here, everything's going to be all right. Now, I'm not saying don't be organized, but I am asking the question that is behind the magic of Ephesus. Are you trying to be the one who controls your life? And whatever form that looks like for you, that's where you put your trust and that's where you put your effort. Or, as Paul is talking to the Ephesians here, are you willing to live with a little mystery in life? Mystery of faith, that is. Mystery that God doesn't always explain what it is that is coming our way before we run into it. But he was not surprised because he already knew it was happening. Are you willing to live with a little bit of mystery in how circumstances develop and say, I don't get it, I wish it were different, and I'm going to trust Christ regardless of what it is that is happening in my sphere of life. That's where I think Paul was especially challenging the Ephesians in this chapter was that they would not revert to trying to take life in their own hands, but they would continue in the power that saved them once and for all and let that be the hands that guided them. Because Paul has kind of turned away from the first couple of chapters where he's talking about this is the power of Christ in you for salvation and explaining it to now using it as an illustration. Saying that if you believe that God had the power to save your eternal soul, then don't shortchange him in saying he's not powerful enough to handle your personal life right now and to guide you and guard you and walk with you. And so he brings over saying, if God is so powerful to change us from life to death as he did in chapter 1 and 2, then he's powerful enough to take care of life right now with you. Because I think all of us know we can try and try, but we fail and fail to make life what we want it to be, just the way it's neat and nice. And for Paul, this was very evident because his life was not neat and nice when he wrote this letter. He was sitting in jail. And you see in verse 13, he's concerned about how the Ephesians are handling this. Because some of the things that could be coming to mind are, if God is so powerful, why is Paul in jail? Is this gospel really the place that we can put our trust and faith? Is it going to let us down and Paul wants them to say, don't lose heart over what I am suffering for you. Don't lose heart that the gospel has lost power. It hasn't. God is still powerful. This is my calling. If you're a fill-in-the-blank person, your second one, calling, not confusion. Before Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, and if you have your Bible, we'll turn to Acts 21 and, and look at that in just a second. But before that, his, his, as he was on the journey to Jerusalem, he stopped to talk with the people of Ephesus. And they said to him, Paul, if you keep going to Jerusalem, we know you're going to be arrested. And Paul says, I know it too. It's my calling. So when he shows up in Jerusalem, he is asked by the brothers there of the Jewish church if he will participate in what a few of the men have set aside as vows to God. Big feast is happening in Jerusalem. Lots of people from around the world have gathered to celebrate according to the word of God. And they said, there's these rumors on the street that you've been teaching people to disavow everything about their Jewish background and to not live according to the word of God for the Jewish people. And so we think it would be helpful to maintain peace in the city if you would sponsor these men, pay for their expenses as they are completing their vow. And Paul says, I can do that. And so when we get to Acts 21, verse 27, 
we find that it's at the tail end of that time that the men had vowed. The seven days were almost complete, it says in verse 27. When the Jews from Asia, seeing Paul in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd again and laid hands on Paul, crying out, Men of Israel, help! That's the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and once the gates were shut, they were seeking to kill him. Word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. Can you imagine what the people of Ephesus might have been asking, knowing that it was over one of their own that Paul was arrested in Jerusalem? You can imagine they're saying, what if we hadn't sent him along? What if we had been more persuasive when we met with Paul? What if we'd grabbed him and thrown him over here and kept him instead of he goes to Jerusalem? And the what ifs, you can imagine, multiply. As they wonder, is there something else that we could have done to prevent this? Was it our fault that this happened? And Paul writes to them and says, it wasn't confusing that day to me what was happening. On the streets, yeah, they were all confused. But in my heart, I was not confused, Paul says. I had a calling, and I simply walked forward into it. So he writes this letter in part to the Ephesians and why he has been hammering away for three chapters now about trusting God, about knowing that God is powerful and is in control is because he's anticipating, perhaps has even heard from the Ephesians that they're not sure that if Paul can be thrown in jail, what can happen to us? Is there something more that we should have done? Again, hear that, what I think is in their minds, that we should have done. These are people who are used to trying to control their circumstances through the magic of their past. What could we have done? And Paul says, this was my calling. We talked about it before I ever went to Jerusalem. This is not confusing. This is simply the path God has walked with me. Similar to what he did with Jeremiah, God had told Paul, you will go to the Gentiles, you will preach the gospel to kings, even to Caesar. And the only way Paul was getting that done was by being arrested at Jerusalem to one day, years later, stand in front of kings and Caesars as his calling had called him to do. So Paul, in sending this letter, is saying, don't lose heart just because you see circumstances have turned against me. God has not turned against me. And there was nothing about it that was your fault. This is simply me walking into my calling. And that's not always an easy thing to say or to hear, is it? Because we like to be in control a bit more than that. And that's where Paul, I think his example, becomes instrumental to us. Because we will all find ourselves in those circumstances where we're asking ourselves, is there more I could have done? Is this my fault? And many times, it simply is not. It simply happened. And we were a part of it happening. We were there without cause behind it. It's kind of like over in Acts chapter 16. Paul was in Philippi, in jail, often found himself there. And you may be familiar with the story of Paul and Silas. This predates his his letter. But we have the same example of Paul in jail and how he reacts. He's been walking around the city. He's been preaching. And this little fortune teller girl, again, we're back into the occult. She's been giving people's horoscopes, including Paul's, without him asking And Paul eventually gets irritated, it says, and casts the demon out and says, no more of this. This is not the way God does the future. And he sends the demon away and 
the girl's owners, because she was a slave, are pretty upset that they're not going to be able to profit off of her anymore. So they call together the mob and say, this guy's teaching things that shouldn't be taught to Romans. He's calling out us to betray our heritage. Sounds familiar from the streets of Jerusalem, doesn't it? It seems to be a constant thing that Paul was saying, this is the word of God, walk in it, regardless of the consequences. And the consequences this time again, Paul ended up in jail, Paul and Silas. And you can imagine what could have been the reaction as they said in jail. They've been beaten with rods, and they've been locked in stocks. You know what it is to hurt in body, even without somebody beating on you. You know what it is to feel that pain. You know what it is to be in a dampness and it gets to your arthritis. You know what it is to be unable to really move around flexibly. That's what stocks were. They held you in one position and the cramps that would come from that. And as Paul and Silas are there for hours, you can imagine a normal reaction would have been for Silas to say, if you just kept your big mouth shut. It wasn't like she was really harming us. In fact, she was bringing attention to us. What more could we ask for? Instead, we're here. And they turn on each other. Or you could imagine that from the pain and the cramping and the beatings, they kind of break down into tears. And don't let anybody tell you the guys don't cry. Yeah, we can break down in tears too. You can imagine that they just come apart at the seams as they're there in jail. We hurt. We don't know what to do. It's going to be worse tomorrow. But as you read in Acts chapter 16, you see that the reaction is at midnight, Paul and Silas were praising the Lord and singing. You remember that story? That's what Paul is asking the Ephesians to do. He says, I'm in jail again. Not a real surprising turn of events there. We talked about this. God is still in control. It's surprising to see how it's playing out, but that it happened. God is still in control. And it's still my calling that we are walking this direction. So how am I going to react? How will you react more importantly, is what he asks of the Ephesians. Will you say God's not in control? Will you collapse into tears? Will you come apart at the seams? No, here's what you should be doing, should be your reaction. You should be in prayer. That's your last fill in the blank. Not pouting. Because it's so easy to get ourselves into that point where we say, Life should be within my hands, and when it messes up, it's all my fault. And so often it's not. Oh, yeah, we do dumb things, and we reap the consequences. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But how much more often is it simply the fact that circumstances are what they are, and we are living in them without even really causing them? And as Paul is talking to the Ephesians and telling them not to lose heart, he says, for this reason, because God is powerful, he has saved you. For this reason, I now bow in prayer for you. Because I know it's difficult for you to hear that I'm in jail. And they kind of had something to do with that Trophimus guy from Ephesus. So let me pray for you, he says. And that's where I'm going to stop today and pray for you. But I'm also going to encourage you to take it into your own practice and don't try to take life into your own hands. Take life to God and leave it in his hands. Would you bow with me? To the God of heaven who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us here at St. Francis, to God be the glory in this church of St. Francis and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me. As we continue to walk into our calling and live by the power of the Spirit in prayer and constant dependence upon the Lord. I invite you to stand and take your hymnal with me, number 572. Like Paul, don't keep it to yourself that God is in control. Even when circumstances are wacky, 
let people know that God is still who you're trusting and pass it on. So today, go and know that God is the same powerful God that saved you. And no matter what circumstances you are in, if they're as difficult as Paul's or as joyous as when Paul and Silas were set free from the prison, he is still the same powerful God with you. And go in peace and power of Christ. Amen. <laughs>